Hi everybody, I just released a few videos about a game I designed called the Resuscitation Bay. It's a virtual cardiovascular system that interacts with drugs. It's evidence-based, physiology-based. And it's a fun place where you can flex your skills using pressors to resuscitate shock. So I want to show you how to actually play the game. This is a super fast tutorial. I also released a walkthrough and a virtual reality video of me playing through a level in VR. But this is just a fast tutorial to get you oriented to the game itself, how to click it, how to actually use the tools. So I'll show you here. How do you get to the game? Thepoisonlab.com. Make sure you put www in front of it, or it might say that the DNS is not up to date. It is, I promise. But www.thepoisonlab.com. Here we go. This is the toxicology podcast that I run. And under medical games and resources, just click that. On this top banner, you're going to click Toxo's Resuscitation Game. Click Play Game, and then click Run Game. All right, a lot of stuff to look at here. Okay, welcome to Our Lady of Pixels Hospital. A little plug for the podcast. Just scroll down. You'll see two different doors here. Click Doors to Enter and the Shock Tank. You're going to want to go through Click the Doors to Enter. The Shock Tank is where you can replay different versions of, a same, of the same shock after you beat it in the game. But we're going to click the doors to enter, put in whatever you want. Uh, we'll just go with awesome. So your favorite nurse sees you walk in. There's a little prompt. Dr. Awesome, I'm so glad you're here. I have a feeling today is going to be a nightmare. There's five patients waiting for you. So you have five beds that you can choose from. And you just click into any one of the beds to start managing a patient and assessing their shock. With you throughout the entire time, you're going to have these quick references down here. You have a uh, click for vasopressor effects and hemodynamic changes in shock. If you click on this, you can see how the different vasopressors work. So for instance, I have epi, which is four plus at beta one, nor epi is three plus at beta one, and epi is three plus at beta. It shows you their relative potencies at the different adrenergic receptors that are used in the cardiovascular system. And you have the changes in the body system, <clears throat> in the body's preload cardiac output and afterload in different types of shock to help you identify what shock you're dealing with. We have, uh, this will be more relevant later, but these are the drug increments that you increase your doses by each time you choose a drug. You'll find that out in a second. And these are the normal ranges of those drugs. So norepi 0.05 to 0.5 mic per kilo per minute. Epi the same, dopamine and dobutamine 1 to 20 mic per kilo per minute. Phenylephrine 1 to 10. Uh, so it just reminds you of normal ranges and how much you're going to increase the dose of the drug in your patient every time you do a titration. So for instance, every time you click norepi, it goes up 0.05 mic per kilo per minute. And then finally, we have normal hemodynamic values. I'll actually show you this once we get into a patient. So let's go to bed one. So bed one. You can read their prompt here. You enter a room to see a woman of advanced age who appears lethargic, tachypnic, doesn't respond to you. Okay, this patient, no surprise, she's septic. She's uh, got a history of depression, hypothyroidism. Here, click on all of these hyperlinks to see what the information is behind them. It changes with each patient, and even if you play the same patient twice, it might change. Heart rate of 115, MAP 24, respiratory rate 27. Pulse sucks 88% on 10 liters of oxygen, yikes, and 10.02. You can see physical exam, labs and imaging. You just click these buttons to get it all to pop out. Then, in each case, you're also going to have, because you're at a teaching hospital, pulmonary artery catheter, arterial line, and central venous line. So click on this little pop out, and you can get your, your values. So I have a central venous pressure of 6, heart rate of 115, ejection fraction of 42 or a stroke volume of 50, cardiac output of 5.75, and a systemic vascular resistance of 378 dynes with a map of 24. And I need this map to be 65 before the level will end. So if you don't know what all these values mean, simply scroll down to the bottom. Like I mentioned, all of these uh, quick references will be with you on every page. And you can go to click for normal hemodynamic values. You can see, okay, my CVP is 6, a normal is 8 to 12. That's a measure of preload. They have low preload. Cardiac output is 5, a normal is 4 to 8. Cardiac output is normal. Afterload is 300, a normal is 700 to 1500. So they have low afterload. 
These below here, you can also see how these different variables interrelate with each other in the game and in real life. MAP is equal to cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume, and stroke volume is dependent on your preload and inversely proportional to your afterload. Okay, so, all right, what kind of shock are you dealing with? Well, if you need help, you can click here. Say I have a low preload, low afterload, high output. This is a distributive shock. It all fits with sepsis. Okay, select all desired interventions. Each click will increase the dose by a set amount. When done, click reassess or intubate if appropriate. So she definitely needs to be intubated, but I want to resuscitate her more first. I'm going to start with some fluid. I could click every one of these, and they're going to increase the dose by this much. So I just gave her fluid. It'll be a half liter of fluid because I clicked fluid once. So let's reassess. There we go. That increased her central venous pressure to 7 from 6. That's wonderful. I think my PO2 is dropping, but I need more resuscitation. Let's give her some more fluid. You can click all of these at once. I'm going to give her fluid right now by itself. Next time I'll do a couple of changes. All right, fluid went up. You can always see what's changing on your cardiovascular system. Right now, nothing. Uh, because I think I'm going to need to intubate her, I'm going to start norepi. Let's try. What happened when I started norepi? My afterload went up. My cardiac output actually went up. And my stroke volume went up. Remember, norepi does have some beta agonism. It is possible that it can increase via its beta 1 and beta 2 effect your cardiac output. You could see either an increase in cardiac output or a decrease. Then what happened? My heart rate went down. Well, if we go over here, we could see that cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume went up, so heart rate goes down to counter-regulate to keep cardiac output somewhat normal. So it looks like when I started norepi, it increased it after load, which is dynes, which I, it also increased it a little bit, my output, and led to a reflex decrease in my heart rate. So that's great. Now I've got time to intubate the patient. Okay, vitals, invasive hemodynamics. Intubating her, crushed my venous return. Okay, continue resuscitation. So here is the effects of intubation. It reduced my preload, and since we know stroke volume is increased with preload, it's going to decrease with a reduced preload. So reduced preload, that reduced my stroke volume, reduced my cardiac output. So you can see each time you change a parameter how it affects the cardiovascular system. Then you just go on to resuscitate however you see fit, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do norepi and fluids as often as I can here. We're getting really good. As I increase fluids, it's going to increase likely my cardiac output. Let's see. Good. See, fluids increase, cardiac output increases from stroke volume because preload is equal to stroke volume per the Frank Starling. Okay, now you can do whatever you want. You can do a whole bunch of things. Let's add phenylephrine and vasopressin, two afterload squeezers. Done. Afterload goes way up. Cardiac output actually goes down because this is the effect that occurs on your stroke volume with unopposed afterload. If you use a bunch of beta agonism, you might start to see some ectopy. Here I'll add on dobutamine and dopamine, something she really doesn't need. Okay, well now I'm starting to see PVCs. Not good, because I'm tickling the heart too much with the beta agonism from really high beta-1 dopamine and really high beta-1 dobutamine. So if you do that too much, you might throw them into VTAC didn't this time, so that's great. Let's try it again. No, we didn't, and she survived. I'll show you what the VTAC looks like, but then after you decide, you uh, once you got to a map of 65, guess which shock you think it is, and then you get a little overview on the shock itself. So this page, it'll tell you what kind of shock it was, It'll give you any guidelines and guideline recommendations for how to treat that shock, as well as the, the sources for it. You can even click and see cutouts of the actual guideline itself for how to manage that shock. You can read through this yourself. And you get a little badge. You go back to the lobby, and it tracks your patients you saved. It tracks the badges you've earned. There's a badge for each room. It also tracks fingers you lose and patients you kill. Um, so you can have fun with that. Once you've unlocked that, you can go into the shock vault, 
we beat distributive shock so you can come in choose distributive generate simulation and enter the sim if you want to play that level again and it'll be slightly different but I don't want to so I'm gonna go home and then the last thing to talk about down here we have training and resources you can review all the different types of shock how they change what preload cardiac output and afterload are their relationship with each other the different types of shock the guidelines for those shock all here if you really want to do some more intense reading and then we have all the literature and landmark trials that would be helpful uh, it's pretty up-to-date there's a few more that have been published that might not be in here but if you want to do some more reading and finally there is an ACLS practice area where you can practice working through um, well sometimes you'll put your patient into VT so this is helpful but you practice working through VTAC with a pulse or VTAC uh, without a pulse in this case I've got no detectable femoral pulse and a wide complex monomorphic rhythm so you can click these to see your ACLS cardiac arrest algorithms. Uh, this is no pulse, so I'm in cardiac arrest, VFib, VT, I should shock this patient and do CPR. If they have a pulse, you can check this algorithm. So these are with you the whole time. So here we go, we'll perform CPR, charge, shock, resume. Okay, VT without a pulse still, perform CPR, charge, shock, resume. Okay, there is a pulse. So now we're in VT with a pulse. Let's go here. This is a patient with a map, you know, not, this is a hypotensive patient. So this is uh, an acutely uh, unstable patient, in which case we're gonna consider sedation and we could consider adenosine here, but then we're gonna do synchronized cardioversion. So let's go ahead and give adenosine, charge for direct current cardioversion. I'm even gonna prepare and give amio because I'm going off the guidelines and I'm shocking. Wow. We changed to normal sinus rhythm, but we don't have a pulse. We're back to our ACLS algorithm. This is PEA, CPR, and epi. Okay, perform CPR, give epi, reassess, back to VT without a pulse. And you can see how this goes. Uh, in this scenario, it doesn't let you do things that aren't guideline recommended. We're back into PEA. And since you, there's no shock, you just click reassess pulse and rhythm. Oh, now we're in VTAC with a pulse again. Let's try this out. I'm going to charge. I'm going to start an amyo infusion. I'm going to shock. PEA. Um, but when you're actually playing the game and you put your patient into VTAC, you can do anything you want. You can kill them on accident. So you got to be careful and try to make the right decisions. Here we go. This patient has a pulse and they're in normal sinus rhythm. This is called return of spontaneous circulation. And we're good to go. So that's how you play the game. You can practice ACLS, you can practice all sorts of different shocks, you can do whatever you want, give vasopressors to a hemorrhagic shock, see what happens. This is the place to try it out. So thanks for following along, and I hope this was a quick, rapid explanation of how you can play the game itself. Okay, if you have any questions, reach out to me on Twitter at empoisonfarmd, or you can email me at talkstalk1 at gmail.com.